Funding for the Our Town podcast is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota and the members of KSMQ Public Television. Thank you. Town, a podcast with KSMQ Public Television. I'm your host, Danielle Till. Very excited to have Graham Briggs, the Director of Public Health, Olmstead County Public Health Services. Welcome, Graham. Thanks for having me, Danielle. It's great to see you again. I know this is not your first time on the show, so we're excited to have you back. And we're going to dive right in because I want to know how you've been since we last talked, which was, was it in March? I feel like the timing the first time we talked was um, was uh, almost predictive or, or something like that. that <laughs> I remember we met in that restaurant. Um, yeah, Cameo. Yeah. Uh, Cameo. Yeah. One of, the, one of the last times I think either one of us was probably out in public. And uh, You are correct because I have been home since March 11th, mm-hmm. teleworking, and um, literally I think you were one of the – well, few people I saw before I sheltered at home. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you're one of the key people people need to know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that worked out great. Um, how have you been? Okay, I think uh, uh, work's been busy. I, I think I could say that with uh, some comfort. Uh, yeah, I think since the last time we met, yeah, I think uh, the conversation revolved around a lot around where are we going and uh, what are what's beginning here and what are we going to see coming related to this and um, I think uh, today we can say that uh, um, we've gone three months now and while we've all learned through the process I think uh, across the world in the United States and here in Olmstead County um, uh, I think we've uh, made quite a bit of progress now and in understanding what this virus is and what it means and how widely it's going to spread. And um, um, while I don't think uh, any response is ever perfect, uh, I think uh, uh, we've put ourselves in a position here in Olmstead County so that uh, um, we're, we're thinking about how this is gonna play itself out now over the next uh, you know, six, 12, uh, potentially 18 months. and. Uh, hopefully uh, get us out of our basements because uh, I think a number of us are sick of it. In fact, you can see today I'm, um, I'm back in my office today. That's part of uh, this transition, I think, is uh, um, very slowly starting to bring a handful of people in a little bit of the time. Uh, I get them out of the house and uh, um, use social distancing and masking and, and things like that uh, in the office setting. Um, with a very small number of people to start and, and rotate those through um, as, as part of that uh, step, you know, back into uh, um, into some normalcy. In fact, Is that your first day back in the office today? Um, I, I have been back more this week uh, than previous weeks. I, I will admit I have stuck out a few times, uh, particularly when I do media interviews. Mm-hmm. And I... You know, I have a five-year-old and a four-year-old who are wonderful human beings. I get it. I get it. <laughs> but not so excited if I'm uh, uh, doing TV or meeting or in an important meeting or something like that nowadays online. And uh, um, it's one thing during a staff meeting if they decide that they're going to run downstairs and crawl on top of me. It's another thing if I'm doing Aww. or something like that. So, You know, I think a lot of people are experiencing different things between either their children or if they have dogs, sometimes I hear dogs barking in the background or windows open, you hear birds chirping. And you know, honestly, the ambiance of that is pretty nice. So yeah, I've been telling people, I think there, there's, there's a lot that we're getting out of this that um, is positive. And um, obviously this is a, is a, you know, public health emergency, but we're learning something where uh, we're learning more about people. Like I could see you know, you've got a, this bright yellow wall behind you, and it says something about you as a person. And, um, you know, I was just on a call yesterday with uh, one of our commissioners where she was sitting in her backyard and had all these birds chirping in the background. Mm-hmm. You know, that. And, um, 
Uh, if I've got kids crawling on me or our terrier barking at the mailman yeah. you know, that you can hear, um, you're learning a little bit more about people and mm -hmm. that we work with. Uh, we're learning a little bit more about uh, that family dynamic. And mm -hmm. who we are. Also. Yeah, these are my happy walls, Graham. It's <laughs> and then on my on my walls, I have a bunch of inspiration because I like being reminded of kind of focusing on on all the good things and how to generate that. So that's that's a part of my my um, background in this. Yeah, yeah. So it's, we're all we're all getting a little bit more info about mm -hmm. success and, and who we are, and that's something I think long term is a, is a bonding sort of thing. So I've been kind of excited, you know, when, when the mood is right or the time is right to let my dog jump on my lap or yeah. my five-year-old or my wife poke in and say hello, you know, and stuff like that. And uh, That's awesome. I see that sometimes. Let's I talk about did, some of those. By the way, I have to tell you, I even did a happy hour virtually. You, with some you did? Yes, yes. It was, How did that go? I, there's a lot of benefits to it. You're already at home. You can have a beer or two uh, with your friends and uh, chat about the goings on of the week or, or whatever else. And uh, all you have to do is, instead of Ubering or something like that, you uh, walk from your deck inside to your kitchen. And your <laughs> yeah. It was, it was uh, pretty convenient. So, uh, in yeah. fact, I'm having one on Friday evening. Uh, my best friend lives in Florida. And so we're going to have a, a virtual happy hour Friday yeah. evening. I yeah. think this is maybe something we should hold on to long after. Right? Uh -huh. I agree. Let's talk more about the positives. Um, you know, I have noticed a lot of walking, people on the trails, you know, walking and social distancing. Um, I think that that is one of the things that has come out of this that I hope stays, I think it's going to stay, is how people are getting outside. Yes. You know, and there's always these ongoing campaigns about getting outside and really um, you know, doing some activities and things like that. What are your thoughts around around that aspect? So, you know, one thing we we watch is uh, uh, movement patterning and uh, where people are going. And part of uh, understanding understanding social distancing is um, is looking at uh, how people are going to work in the grocery store and things like that. And so, um, while it's all de-identified and aggregate. Uh, um, places like Google and cell phone companies and things like that can make this sort of stuff available for us to take a look at. And uh, so we could see in Minnesota um, just the amount of people using the DOT cameras, you know, things like that uh, have decreased significantly um, as the governor put the stay at home order in place. And um, all of our metrics were telling us that yeah, Minnesota's doing a, a pretty good job overall. I know there's one report that was a questioned how well we were doing, but it was looking at the amount of distance that you travel to work back and forth. Oh, interesting. So the Metro looked great. Rochester didn't look so great, but then again, you know. Oh, no. <laughs> when I lived in big cities, I have like a 30-mile drive to work, you know. I sure. have like a two-mile drive now, so my actual distance didn't tr didn't change very much. But but overall, it looked like Minnesota was, was doing a pretty good job uh, with the social distancing stuff. And uh, um, one of the things that we had access to with that is uh, looking at park usage. And uh, that's one thing that we just saw skyrocket. You know, we've got our baseline where this is in a typical day, how many people are out on the interstates or driving to work or uh, going into uh, malls, you know, or whatever. Some of that stuff basically zeroed out. But um, almost immediately as... Uh, Park started opening where you could be outside, you could be distanced and, and be safe. Um, that usage has gone way higher than what we have historically seen and what we would see as the average amount of use. So, so that's been pretty cool, I, I thought, to see. I hope that it is cool. We mm -hmm. actually had uh, someone from Parks and Rec on a few weeks ago to give ideas and the activity that is happening within the parks. And that's definitely a common theme is people are utilizing those. Mm -hmm. Let's pivot a little bit. I want to I want to check in. I think it's it's obvious that we need an update on the status of COVID nineteen in Olmsted County. What is the status of that? Well, I, I think this is kind of where I started going in, in the beginning. Was uh, last time we talked, there was a lot of what's it going to be, and we see something's coming, but we don't know exactly what it is. And I think while well, we're not through it. Uh, to this point, we do know much better now what it is. And 
Um, so it, it, it's pretty apparent right now, I think looking at the data at a state level in Minnesota that um, at least as, as far as the natural course of the progression goes, that uh, um, we've made it uh, through what we would call a first wave of, uh, of transmission. Um, while the nation is still in the midst of a first wave, you know, we saw this start at basically New York and in the East Coast, that wave propagates throughout the entire country. So while New York and Connecticut and Boston now, they're on their way down and uh, um, looking like uh, um, the virus is not transmitting as much there, we're still seeing that wave propagate through other parts of the country. And unfortunately, right now, I, I know Texas and Arizona and Florida and, and some other states are are really seeing uh, rapid increases in, in usage of hospital beds. Here in Minnesota, it looks like we had a fairly um, <clears throat> a fairly gradual run up in a, and now a fairly gradual uh, walk back down as far as our peak goes. Um, we can look at the increase in testing that we did in Minnesota, but there is a lot of questions about you know, are you testing more or less? And what does that really mean for the transmission of the virus? If you test a lot more, you say you're going to find more cases. And right. uh, so one, one thing we can look at is hospitalization. That, that doesn't have that test bias. It, it, what it relies on is I feel sick enough that I'm going to go to the doctor. The doctor says I'm sick enough that I'm going to be admitted and, uh, the, and I'm going to have a positive COVID test. And so there's, um, it, it's based a lot more on, on real need and not our surveillance uh, um, or capacity and, and that sort of thing. So um, we can see in Minnesota overall, our hospital bed usage and, and uh, now our ICU usage um, looks like it reached a peak a, a few weeks back and has been declining ever since then. Um, now, I think we do have uh, some risk here. So this is something we wanted to keep an eye on in public health. But, um, We've, we've had um, uh, a stepwise increase in, in people getting back out, like myself being in the office today, No, mm -hmm. our staff are starting to come back and restaurants opening up and things like that. So we're watching very closely to see if we see a return or, or that uh, transmission start increasing again and hospital bed usage start going up. But uh, um, so far, you know, I was actually telling somebody the other day, there's just no blip at all on the state level data. It's just every day it's marching down a little bit more. Okay. At hospital bed usage. The testing, which is useful, it's not what we, what we want to rely on completely, but that is suggesting that uh, there's less activity. And uh, so you go kind of through this progression too, where people get sick, they get tested. Then they go to the hospital, then they go to the ICU, uh, some of them. And, and unfortunately for the very few that we've had uh, here in Olmstead, uh, death is that lagging indicator. And so even the deaths in Minnesota at the state level have started to, to slow down now. So all of that is indicating mm -hmm. um, we're on the downslope, but we need to stay vigilant. So the protest mm -hmm. is something that a lot of us in public health are, are concerned uh, may increase risk for um, uh, for some of our residents, and uh, uh, we want to make sure that um, um, we're interrupting transmission if we do see anything related to both opening up businesses and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, the the recent protests. If I nail that, or if I nail that down to Olmstead County, we're um, mostly the same. You know, in a nutshell, when we when we look at ourselves compared to the state, uh, um, we had a little bit of an increase in cases, I think, as uh, right in the middle of May, as things started opening back up, I think, honestly, there was some social distancing fatigue that people had. And so uh, I was tempted. I really yeah. restrained. Yeah. I think a lot, a lot of people that last week or two. Uh, yeah, Memorial weekend. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So so we saw that in the data. We saw a little bit more increased transmission. Uh, um, but Really, when we're when we're, when we put numbers on it, you know, we were averaging in Olmstead County, confirming. Now that's just a sliver of the cases, since a lot of people don't have symptoms. We know that now, um, but we were averaging, you know, eight or so cases a day uh, in the beginning of May that would come into our system, and we'd investigate. And uh, we spiked up to about uh, fifteen or so cases a day, just for okay. a week or two. And now have started to level off again. It looks like at about 12, a dozen cases a day. So a little bit higher than what we've seen before. And while we're watching very closely, it looks like we're kind of leveling off now at this uh, uh, 12 or so cases a day. So very manageable. I, I think uh, that's a big part of what we talked about last time is uh, 
figuring out where we're going to go with this and uh, um, how health departments are geared to respond to outbreaks and things like that. Um, Graham, how do you speak to people that think it's a hoax? Because there are some people that don't think it's real. So how, what would you say to that? Well, I, I think I can say working in the field of public health that this is very real. This is not the flu. Uh, this is uh, not something that uh, we're overhyping. I know I just heard the other day that the media is overhyping this or something like that. And um, I think for those that have watched it all, uh, if you've seen the, the look in people's eyes uh, in New York City as they are going through their first wave, you can see this is not a hoax. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been working in infectious disease for 20 years. And I can tell you from the long-term care outbreaks that we've seen here in Olmsted County, this is not a virus that behaves like other ones that we've seen. Um, and my guess is that's because we don't have native immunity to this we're developing. And so it's been a huge challenge, I think, uh, um, in some of these high-risk settings to, uh, to get transmission under control and uh, uh, to limit the morbidity and mortality that we've seen. So. We've been fairly lucky here in Olmstead. Uh, I think we, the time that we bought with social distancing really allowed us to build a surveillance system and a response system here tailored to COVID. And so we've been lucky enough that our long-term care facilities, we've been able to interrupt transmission. We've got 12 deaths in this county, which is 12 too many, but right. comparably um, it could have been much worse. And that's really a credit to the staff that have been working at times 80 plus hour weeks to uh, to interrupt transmission in these facilities. Mm. Can, I can tell people that have some doubts that uh, um, that has not been easy work. It's been life-saving work. And uh, the whole idea here is that we're trying to um, keep ourselves in a position so that while we probably can't stop transmission, we can control it enough and slow it down enough so that those that get really sick have access to, um, to every medical uh, uh, advantage that we have in this country. And as long as we do that, the fatality rate is fairly low, but it is still many times more deadly than influenza, even for those that have all of the medical care uh, possible. Once you lose that and, and get into situations where you're running out of oxygen tanks or don't have ventilators, and, uh, the fatality rate then goes uh, up significantly. And uh, then we get into really, really ugly scenarios. That's what mm -hmm. I think a lot of us in public health across the country are really trying to work at now is to keep us out of those sort of situations. I appreciate you sharing that perspective. And I just have to, to say to the families impacted by COVID-19 and, and, the, and the losses of life, you know, our thoughts are with them. and. And for everybody that's working in the field, you know, trying to, um, you know, establish preventative measures and, and implement them so that it, it doesn't get transmitted or, you know, protect people as much as possible. And thank you for your work, Graham, and your team in that regard. Um, so the question related to precautions, has any of those changed since the restrictions have been kind of lifted a little bit? Do you have any other additional information on how people can uh, be safe and, and be out there? <laughs> well, there's the tried and true stuff like wash your hands and things like that. But I have to admit, uh, this is something that we in public health got wrong in the beginning with masks when you talk about prevention. And, um, you know, I've been trained for years and years that uh, with the respiratory virus, uh, the important thing is that you have an N95 mask, which is a filtered mask that uh, is made to protect people from getting exposed. Like I used to wear that one of those when we'd go into homes with cases of tuberculosis, you know, and things like that. And so that's to protect the person. Um, people in hospitals wear these uh, to protect themselves in uh, when there's infectious disease in, in hospital rooms and things like that. And all of our attention was always on how do we protect ourselves. And um, this realizing that there was this huge shortage in N95 masks uh, very early in the pandemic, um, led us to really thinking about um, how we were using masks. And while I've been trained, I was even saying, you know, and I don't remember if I, during our interview I mentioned it, but- I don't think, I can't remember if we talked about masks, but- yeah, Back then it was, uh, no, we don't encourage, you know, we don't, we don't need people to wear masks. Uh, it's not going to- Oh, right. Okay, I remember. I don't know if we talked about it, but I remember that messaging, yeah. There was, yeah, that message that this is, you know, wearing a surgical mask, or I'll even show you my- 
I have my cloth mask here that some of our staff in the EOC made. I don't know if you can see. Awesome. I have one too that I wear out and about. It says, if you can read this, you are too close to me. Oh, that's cute. I, <laughs> <laughs> I need one of those. <laughs> yeah. But uh, we were saying for a while that, you know, you, uh, there's no need to do that. And we had to change the way that we thought about things because of this uh, shortage. And what it turned out is we weren't thinking about the fact that you can protect others. And uh, that's what the challenge I think in the messaging has been for, for some people to hear is that uh, um, um, we were wrong in the beginning when we were talking about masks. And those of us that worked in this for decades uh, were, were, uh, were focusing on how you protect yourself from this, where the conversation really needed to evolve to saying um, cloth masks and surgical masks, uh, which we've used for years to protect um, people from infectious people um, are actually a, a, a good alternative uh, with an N95 shortage because you still are protecting other people. While you may, you're wearing this mask isn't going to keep me from getting COVID-19 at the grocery store, but if I'm asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic, it's going to keep me from giving it to other people. And if we all do that, Right. Then we're all preventing it's help. from getting sick. It's a true like community sort of effort thing. And so um, it, it, it's a simple act of kindness for, yep. for not only yourself, but for other people. Yeah. So so that's my my admit today is we got that wrong in public health. And it's something uh, as we've retooled and adjusted, uh, I, I think we wanted to make that uh, clear to, to those mm -hmm. that we to that uh, um we're learning just like everybody else on this and uh, hopefully evolving as we do and, and uh, correcting and changing our messaging and uh, the way that we're doing our work, and, you know, testing as far as asymptomatic, you know, we didn't know people were asymptomatic in the very beginning. That's changed the, the way that we're responding to outbreaks. And so there's a lot of that stuff going on internally too, as we're learning about this. So summertime is happening. People are wanting to get outside. They're wanting to do things slowly, but surely some things are opening up as well. Um, what are your recommendations uh, for people to protect themselves and feel safe? I don't know if you saw that article on M Live or something like that. I can't remember the, the source, but it ranked kind of, if you do tennis, it's like rank number one. And then, you know, and I, I asked from folks that shared it, you know, what the sources are in that regard. Did you see that article? And is there a uh, appropriate, credible, supported resource that ranks kind of the activities people can do and know the risk? I don't think I saw that specific article. I'll send it over. I'll send it over. Yeah, it I'll take a look at it. I can, uh, I can take a look at it and let you know. Um, I, I think the idea, though, is valid. Um, that playing football, for example, I, I think is going to be more risky than playing tennis. And um, I think, again, as we're learning about this, um, while there's some potential for fomite transmission or, or you know, door handle transmission, for lack of a better term, uh, from one person to another, um, what we're seeing as far as the cases and uh, transmission um, in the community here and, and across the country is that uh, close contact uh, with uh, airborne droplets is, is really the, the risk. So basically being within a couple feet of people and talking or singing or laughing or coughing is uh, putting a little um, uh, virus into the air that the person right next to you is breathing in. And so um, if you're keeping that in mind and you're limiting you know, both the distance with people and masking and, and that sort of thing, you could theoretically, you know, play tennis. Uh, um, you're far enough apart that you maybe don't even need to wear a mask if, uh, if you're keeping that distance. And um, then there's just a little bit of risk uh, with the tennis ball. People are touching them. And I know there's right. talk with baseball that once somebody touches the ball, now it's like retired. And you well, then you could just kind of sanitize it, right? Just sanitize yeah. it real quick. <laughs> yeah. There will be no delay in the game at that point, right? Yeah, I think one is still where we get to is with a pandemic virus, it's somehow like a superhero movie or something like that, where these things are like somehow, you know, they're going to uh, destroy everything. This is just a virus. It, it, you know, it's killed by bleach. It's, you know, it's uh, um, uh, more routine uh, than it is absurd, you know, as far as this virus goes. So um, you can take a tennis ball and uh, wipe it off real quick with a disinfectant and uh, you'd probably be good to go right after that. <laughs> okay, like too, it, you know. what was that? 
Oh, sunlight too kills it. That's uh, that's something that we see pretty routinely. That's one of the reasons outdoors, lots of reasons outdoors are better. Um, one of those reasons is uh, UV light uh, uh, generally is not very healthy to viruses and bacteria. And so virus, just like a lot of other ones, if, uh, uh, if I took this mask and it had uh, COVID on it and I stuck it out on my deck for an afternoon, uh, that's probably just about as good as uh, sending it through the washing machine or something like that to get it disinfected. So um, UV light does a, a real number on viruses and it's uh, nice to have in our corner. Good to know. Okay, traveling. What are your thoughts on that? Especially well, across I, state lines. Yeah, I, I think... Um, kind of like the going outdoors thing too the first thing i'd encourage people to think about is is about your situation and so if um uh, if you're 25 and you're not going to be around um aging individuals or anything like that and you want to go to the beach while well, we'd still recommend you wear a mask and socially distance and we don't want people to amplify virus like uh, like what we're seeing in some bars and things like that around the country um, if you've got um, um, a wedding or a baby shower to go to that's across the country or something like that, uh, to consider your situation. Like, are, are you at high risk? If you get this virus, uh, are you going to put other people who are at high risk at risk? And um, can you do it safely? And you know, obviously, airlines uh, with that close contact are, are going to be uh, potentially a little bit more risky. And uh, so as people are making that decision, uh, you're know, working with the airline on whether there's masking being done or what sort of precautions they're they're taking to ensure that people are safe versus say driving where maybe you uh, um, are a little bit more in control of uh, the exposure that you put yourself to and um, so I think uh, while you can't say nobody should travel and everybody should travel it, it really now becomes a, a person's personal decision and I just encourage people to both consider their health with the real science here on who is at risk and and, and understanding um, that while uh, people over are at very high risk, uh, we are seeing severe health outcomes and deaths and kids and, and young adults as well without under health conditions. So, so people are going to need to decide what risk tolerance they've got with this. And, and then secondarily, I think what we try to remind people a lot in public health about is it's not just about you, it's about the people that you're around. And if you have an aging mother-in-law that lives with you, you know, uh, getting COVID maybe isn't a great idea for you to bring that home to someone who is at high risk. And, um, you know, obviously families that uh, have loved ones with, say, uh, cancer and things like that really want to consider you know, if they're at risk, limiting that risk for their loved ones and uh, um, trying to ensure that uh, um, they're not potentially exposing other people that uh, could have uh, severe outcomes related to this. What if you're staying at a hotel or like an Airbnb? Should you roll up in there with all the Clorox and <laughs> sanitizing equipment? I mean, do you trust? I mean, trust well, that in... I can't speak for other hotels in other jurisdictions, but generally, since we're not seeing environmental transmission as a big factor, you're probably, oh. unfortunately, this is gross, but more likely to get bed bugs from a hotel than ah. <laughs> COVID-19 in this country. And um, so I think there is a fair amount of disinfection that's going on at hotels across the country. Here in Olmstead County, I know that there's... Um, um, an effort that's happening um, uh, with some of our hotels and some of our industry on, on trying to um, um, ensure that both staff and customers, whether it's at a hotel or a restaurant or a boutique shop or wherever, that, um, um, that they're able to post uh, how they're disinfecting things and how they're keeping their staff safe and how, how they're keeping their customers safe. And I thought that was a really cool um, uh, system that was just a voluntary thing that businesses started talking about doing and we're interested in getting some advice from the health department on how can we set up so that we both keep our staff safe and that we keep uh, our customers safe and then on top of that be able to share with the people that are coming into our venues how we're, how we're doing this and uh, the efforts that we're making uh, to in ensure that uh, we stay as safe as possible during this. Graham, I really appreciate your, um, you and your team's efforts. It's been phenomenal, always connecting with you. Any parting thoughts on uh, that you want to share with our, our listeners and viewers? 
Well, I'm, I'm happy to come back anytime. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, Danielle. And I think if there's a message for today, last time we were at the beginning of this, I wonder now if we're maybe at the beginning of the middle. And so uh, if needed, I'm happy to come back. I'd love to come back when we're at the end of this. And uh, be able to- I agree. And, and then we need to have some sort of like, um, where we see each other in person. <laughs> <laughs> I have all these friends now that like are virtual. And uh, I know, I know. Yeah, so okay. definitely, definitely, uh, we got to do that again. I really appreciate you coming on the show. And again, uh, Kari, your, your, your sidekick, we appreciate her too. Um, thank you so much for tuning in to our town podcast, a KSMQ public television show. I would like to thank Annie. She's amazing. She's the co-producer on the show, does a ton of work related to it and creates good work. So thank you so much, Annie. Um, leave us a review. And if you like what you heard, please subscribe. So you can catch us on um, Facebook, Twitter, at KSMQ, hashtag Artum. Tune in next week for more on Artum.